Verse 15, notice over here, behold, I come as a thief. Okay, so behold meaning, behold, you know, hey, did I get your attention? That's the idea. Look, look, that's what behold means. I come as a thief. So God comes as a thief. When he comes down at Armageddon, it's also known as being a thief. Because look at the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. You might say, why is his coming like a thief? The reason why it's, his coming is like a thief, it's going to come down. He's going to come down and attack the enemy in a way where they least expect it. Where they can't. So it's amazing. You, they're going to imagine United Nations. They have all the technology that's going to read up what's going on in the atmosphere. We prepared for the UFOs because we just released those videos out just last week. So we got, we're going to prep up. We're going to be ready for this alien invasion. And just like I watched Independence Day, says the millennial and the younger generations, this is cool stuff. So, yeah, we're going to b battle these aliens together. But see, Satan, he what? He's programming them. Yep. He's programming them to get all prepared and to uh, accomplish the demonic purpose. So everyone gathers up, they gather up all the United Nations because they train the nations that despite of impossible odds, we shall overcome. That's what they ingrained the people time and time again. They hammered it on their heads. So then they're all getting ready, but even though despite of how much science they used and logical predictions that they used and the technology that they built up and all the meetings of the table that they did to prepare carefully, God's going to come down where they least expect it. Imagine that. That's God's refuting the wisdom of the mighty. Look at Joel chapter 2. Look at verse 1. It's the day of the Lord, right? Joel chapter 2, verse 1, day of the Lord. See, that's Armageddon. But keep reading over here. It mentions it's going to come down like a thief. Verse 7, they shall run like mighty men. That's God's army Amen. that joins him. They shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march everyone on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Look at that. <clears throat> Verse 8, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Look, there's no way you're going to win. Yeah. Verse 9, they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a what? Thief. thief. See, that's the day of the Lord. It's going to come down like thieves. And then they're like, okay, I see them. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, shoot the machine gun them right there. Ah! And then you just appear right behind them and say, boo. And they're like, ah! bah, bah, bah. Yeah. like a thief where you least expect it. This is totally sci-fi, what movies in Hollywood's tried to yeah, depict. It, right? but they're superheroes, that's right. All right, Revelation chapter 16 again. Great now, here's the thing, is that we can see that Armageddon is going to be like a thief, but here's something else. In this verse, we see that Armageddon's like a thief, but there's something else that's like a thief. And this is what the verse is pointing out. It can refer to, it is referring to Armageddon, we see that, but the verse is more concentrating on something else. It's not more of Armageddon, it's that post-tribulation rapture. So whether you believe a rapture in the middle of the tribulation or after the tribulation, Bible-believing Christians teach that whenever this rapture is going to occur, it's going to occur sometime at the tribulation, whether middle or after. And this tribulation rapture is going to happen like a thief. That's the idea. Where people least expect it. God's going to snatch them away where people least expect it. That's why it's called a thief. I thought you're pre-tribulation rapture, preacher. Yeah, I am. You might say, but what, what's the problem here? It's not a problem. I believe in two raptures. It's that simple. If some of you are curious about it, just uh, look at our video channel, 
and then watch Amazing Dispensational Truth from Genesis to Revelation, and it'll teach you two different raptures. That's in your Bible. Okay, but anyways, let's look at the passage over here. Keep reading. Verse 15, Blessed is he that watcheth. Why would it say to the saints at the tribulation, you have to watch, you have to be wary? Why? Because of the previous line. He's coming like a thief. God's coming like a thief. So you better look out and be aware. And keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So see, they have to be watching for his coming because he's going to come down like a thief and snatch them where they least expect it. So let's look at the passage. Look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Look at this. Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. So Tim LaHaye and Jack Van Impey, they're actually wrong for teaching that, you know, when God comes like a thief in the night, and there's a famous uh, movie during that time called Thief in the Night, a lot of them uh, wrongly teach that that phrase is referring to the Christian church being raptured. Now, it is true that our rapture can be similar where God's going to snatch us up like a thief. But that phrase, that passage at Matthew 24, is not the Christian rapture. This is referring to the post-tribulation rapture, where God's going to snatch them away like a thief. Look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. Watch therefore. See that? For ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. That matches with Revelation 16. Be watchful because God's going to uh, you don't know when he's going to come. Why? Because he's going to snatch you. Look at the rapture at verse 31. Uh, verse 30, he's coming, right? That's him coming at verse 30. Is that correct? If that's the case, then look at verse 31. He's snatching them up to heaven. He's rapturing them. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. See that? He's going to gather them up. He's going to rapture them. Uh, John Ankerberg and some people, they mistakenly think, no, this is just gathering the nation of Israel. Uh, the nations, it's just gathering the nation of Israel together for Armageddon. No, that's not what it is. Because look at this. It's snatching them. It's snatching them. Look at verse 40 and 41. One taken, the other left. See, that's what it is. And not only that, the angels are gathering them from one end of heaven to the other. They're going up. They're going up at verse 31. The angels are gathering them from one end of heaven to the other. Okay, so we see right here God's going to come down like a thief where they least expected. That's why they have to be ready, which is why this makes sense when you look at Matthew chapter 25. Look at this. Scripture with Scripture makes everything sense. Look at Matthew 25. Look at this, what the Bible says. Now, Revelation 16, as I wrap this up and call it a day, let me wrap it up by saying this. Revelation 16, 15, let me finish that verse. It says, blessed is he that watcheth. Why? And keepeth his garments. He's got to keep his garment. Lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Their works are accounted for with their garment. If their works is not good, then their garment is going to be shorter or it's going to be naked. How was that proven? That was proven at Revelation 3. Remember, Revelation 2 and 3 have a doctrinal application to the tribulation, even though they have a spiritual application to the church, but they have a doctrinal application to the tribulation. Revelation 3 says is that uh, to this group at Laodicea, if you don't do your works, then your garment... You're, is going to be shorter and you're going to be naked. That's a tribulation application. So God was telling people at the tribulation, make sure you do your works well or you're going to be naked in your garment. And if they don't do their works well, where they're expecting and wary of Christ coming, look at what happens here. They're going to miss the rapture. That's why they miss the rapture. Look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, be out to meet him. See that? He's coming where they least expect it. 
Verse 7, Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. See, they weren't prepared. They weren't wary and watchful. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us for you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Look at that. They went up to heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb with Jesus up in heaven, and the door was shut. Look at verse 11. Lord, Lord, open to us. But verse 12, God says what? I don't know you. And that's what he says to lost people. That's why the tribulation, your salvation is dependent upon your works. Your rapture is dependent upon your works. A lot of people worry about, am I going to lose my salvation? Am I going to miss the rapture? No, because this is only applying to people in the tribulation. Christians in the church were eternally secured no matter what sin you commit, and you're going to be raptured no matter what. This is all applying to tribulation, not to you. That's why verse 13 says what? Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Look at that. See, that's why you have to be watchful and wary. That's why you have to be watchful and wary. Now, I'm going to throw this little thing real quickly at Revelation 16, 15, because I think this is an interesting nugget that Bible believers should delve into, because this is a question. So this is a question, and I know some of the people in my church, they're going to go, ooh, 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 and they're going to research it, so I want you to actually research and explain to me. All right, so we know Revelation 3, it's a doctrinal application to the tribulation, to the to this group at Laodicea that, hey, you better do your works or you're going to be naked, right? Uh, Revelation 16, 15, make sure you do your works or you're going to be naked, right? And they're going to see your shame, right? So I have a question over here. My question is this then. So it shows right over here that it seems like if their works are dependent upon their garment, so that peop uh, then it sounds like over here you can still be saved over here at verse 15. Because all it is is you're just naked, but you're still, you're still a saved person. That's what it seems to indicate over here. It seems to indicate that. Because it doesn't talk about a person uh, burning in hell over here. It just shows that your works are dependent on your garment. And if you don't do your works well, then you're going to be naked. Doesn't that match with saved Christians? Yeah, saved Christians, they don't burn in hell, but a lot of them are going to be butt naked at the judgment seat of Christ. Because their works are dependent upon their garments. So I want an explanation to this passage. Now I can provide you this explanation, which makes a lot of sense. Here's the explanation. The explanation is, when they're naked, they do lose their salvation here. And that's different from a saved Christian. You might say, how so? Because it's very simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, compared with Revelation chapter 3, those two verses show that when you're doing your works then it depends upon the amount of treasure you get and the amount of clothes that you get. That's what the verse shows. Well, what if I'm a failure in that, says a Christian. 1 Corinthians 3 continues showing over here that even though your works are burned, you're not burned, but your works are burned. See, so you can be naked and without reward, but you're still saved. That's what 1 Corinthians 3 shows. Well, what does that make it different with the tribulation saint at Revelation 16, 15? What makes it different with the tribulation saint over here is because if you look at Matthew 25, God doesn't even know these people, and they lost the Holy Ghost. See, they lost their salvation. They're considered lost people. And when God says, I never knew you, what does he say? Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. So that matches with Matthew 25, where God says, I don't know you, and the latter part of Matthew 25, where God says, I never knew you, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. So that's why this is referring to salvation here for the tribulation saint. Well, why are they naked and they see a shame? Very simple. Because people who are cast into hell, what are they? They're naked. They're naked. They don't even have the garment, the righteousness on them. In hell, all they are is naked dust and ashes, and they're cast into the lake of fire. That's why. That's why. That's why everyone's going to see their shame. So that seems like uh, the most rational explanation. But I'm wondering if some Bible believer might have a deeper explanation for that one.